Judy is a, a nurse. I'm an Army nurse. I've been in the United States Army Reserve for 24 years. I'm in my 25th year, just finished off the 24th. Um, I started out at the, I was commissioning as a um, second lieutenant, went up to the ranks, and now hold the rank of uh, full grade colonel. My duty station is in Cedar Rapids. We have a medical unit there. It's known as the um, Detachment 1424 U.S. Army Hospital. We're just a detachment unit, and my headquarters is located in Des Moines. So now at that unit, in my, my past positions that I've served, I've been the commander of the unit um, of about 125 soldiers, and now I've stepped down due to my rank. I am now in charge of the, our medical readiness, which is also still a big task, and so we still need to stay focused for um, when we get called up, which will be two years from now. We're in our, we'll be in our call-up cycle. Well, thank you, uh, Colonel. Now, next we'll have uh, Captain Anthony Tisdale of Special Force, U.S. Army. Good, uh, good morning. This, I'm Anthony Tisdale. Um, as Melvina stated, I'm a Vietnam veteran, um, United States Army. I had a, a infantry. Uh, basic uh, military occupational specialty with a prefix for special forces. I was drafted into the military and at that time they couldn't graduate enough officers out of uh, West Point or the service academies so they had a program which they called Officer Candidate School and you had to score so, so high on your battery test to be qualified for that. And I qualified. And upon the uh, advice of my stepfather, who was a World War II vet, he suggest, he strongly suggested that I go to officer candidate school because that would eliminate the number of people telling me what to do. And I followed through with that. And uh, I got my commission as a second lieutenant out of uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Got assigned to, uh, went to airborne school. Got, a time, got assigned to the uh, 7th Special Forces Group in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, and within a year I had my orders for Vietnam. I was assigned to the uh, 199th Light right Infantry Brigade. And unbeknownst to me, uh, my uh, first infantry assignment was uh, participating in the invasion of Cambodia where I was wounded and I got a Purple Heart. Uh, and I had one of those million dollar wounds where I was able to, uh, I was afforded the uh, chance to medevac back all the way back to the States where I was at uh, Irwin Army Hospital in Kansas because that was the nearest uh, hospital base to my home here in Iowa. Um, other than that, I can add things uh, to our conversation this morning as we progress through the introductions. Then next we have a first class, uh, Sergeant First Class Gaston Moore of the U.S. Army. Well, good morning. My name is Gaston Moore. I first joined the service back in 1975 as a private. Um, in a nutshell, I came out to the military as a Sergeant First Class. I had several jobs in the military. First starting off as a photographer and then a bus driver. Uh, also got to be a drug and alcohol coordinator. Um, taught ROTC at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, served in Iraq for nine months with the 101st Airborne. And that's just in a nutshell about myself and we'll talk more later. Anthony, uh, you uh, said you were in Vietnam, and um, kid, next year is going to be the 50th year for Vietnam vets, and, and, and the Cedar Valley has contacted the Sister Soldier Network and asked them to be involved in a, um, well, starting on, in January and going to um, a service day, which is June 11th, I believe. What 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 kind of uh, things you like to see happen with veterans of, of Vietnam? It's coming and uh, going up on that 50th anniversary. Specifically, uh, I'd like to see them step forward and be recognized as veterans of uh, that particular uh, 
era. Uh, because far too often during that time period they weren't recognized at all. And uh, the veterans themselves had a, a part to play in that non-recognition also in that uh, just for instance, uh, I remember when I, uh, there were protests and everything going on during that, that particular uh, time period. Uh, it was an unpopular war, but all wars are unpopular. And I remember my first job application, I think that was at, in Detroit for uh, General Motors, and I couldn't find print way down at the bottom of Vietnam better. Uh, today I put it in bold letters. Uh, wherever you ask for your uh, military service record. Um, and what else did you want? I, I wanted to know what kind of uh, things that, that other than you, you said you'd like to be recognized. That, oh, but, uh, would you, uh, and, and, and also in regard to being recognized, uh, a lot of the Vietnam era vets aren't aware, just as many other Korean War vets and World War II vets are aware that there, there, there's a compens uh, compensatory system out there um, that helps those that fall through the net. Um, combat will put a different edge to your psyche. And uh, uh, many of the vets suffer from a post-traumatic stress disorder. They don't even know it. But they action, their actions uh, uh, lend proof to that. Um, I remember when I first applied, when I got out in 73, as I served from 68 to 73. And by the way, I was drafted. Um, on my first examination, I think I got 5%. Today, uh, uh, after continually uh, pursuing the uh, the uh, system through the uh, Veterans Administration, I'm up to 90 percent. Um, and I got another appeal in because it does have a, that post-traumatic stress disorder, it, it affects your lives in many ways. I recall, uh, I vividly recall when I was, I was homeless uh, three years after I, I got out of service, two to three years after I got out of service and this lasted for something six years before I was able to get some help and, and uh, straighten my life up in that regard. Uh, my military service uh, has been a blessing to me as far as uh, the camaraderie that I, I have with people that have served with me, uh, i.e. gas and more. We've, we've worked together in different, uh, in uh, the telecommunications industry specifically media time. And uh, you can identify with fellow veterans. Yes, and you want to talk a little bit about your uh, experience? Oh, sure. Um, well, Anthony talked about PTSD. That is very serious. I myself was did not know I had PTSD because I didn't know how to you, I, you can identify, I cannot identify it, but I knew that there was something wrong with me. Now, it didn't surface right away. Okay, it took time, and I just noticed there was things going on with me mentally that I didn't understand. And me being who I thought I was or who I am, a strong-minded person, the mind is very powerful, and I, it's hard to put it in words without going into detail. I just knew something was wrong and I was not my right self. And so I started seeking help on it, professional help. And come to find out, yes, I had post-traumatic stress disorder. And there is a lot of guys out there who has that. And it, when I went and got checked out, it amazed me to see people way back from the Vietnam era you know, coming forward with this. So, so it's been around for a long time. Uh, and they didn't know how to handle it years ago. and didn't, didn't know how to label it. And, and right now, today, I served over in Iraq for nine months, like I said. And when I came back, and what I said to them, I said, do you think anybody 
who served in a combat environment, do you really think they will come back normal? No, you don't. I have suppressed so much, and when I got out the military for two years, I was I suffered for two years battling this, battling what was going on inside me with my mind, uh, thinking I was going crazy, and finally I found the right help, and they started pointing me in the right direction to get this resolved professionally. Uh, but what people didn't understand, every day that I was back, um, I used to be dri driving down the street and just bust out in tears. Didn't know why. Uh, PTSD. Okay. Um, but, and I was awarded 50%. Okay. Thank God. You know. Now, we're saying this in a negative way, okay? Yes, we face combat, but anybody can face PTSD, you know, dramatically, car wreck, you know, traumatized. That can happen to anyone, but we're just talking military right now. Um, but thank God I'm on the right track and everything's going good for me, okay? And, and Tina, since you and, and that are still in active duty and nurse, can you kind of. I mean, I'm going to have to say. <laughs> My, my heart is out there for you who do suffer post-traumatic stress disorder because in, in the military, in, in my job, what I was doing before, I was also do the briefs for suicide, I also do the briefs for um, uh, sexual assault. There's so many soldiers out there who have not come forward just because of the stigma alone that if you seek attention, that means that's showing a sign of being weak, saying that you have a mental disorder. So I'm encouraging those people who have any signs, anything that you know that you're not your normal self, you know you're not the same since you've been back, you've been over there in the sand pit, you know you need to come back over here, you, you're not the same. It's hard to talk to your family about that. It's hard to talk about people who don't know what you're saying. Like when I first sat down, Gas <laughs> says, what was your MOS? You know, okay, I'm a 66 age. You know, I know what he's talking about, but you just can't say that to people around you because you need to be supportive. And it's... There's another whole another gamut that goes along with that. Like you said, you're never the same. It affects you. It affects your family. But also, there's education that needs to come along with that. First of all, we need to have it. We have, we need to have the monies in place so the soldiers can get the help that they need because it's going to be ongoing. I know they have the warrior transition units and all those kind of things for people who are active duty. But what about the people who have served and been out? They still need a channel where they can get the t where they can get help that they need for the post traumatic stress disorder. First, it has to be identified. You know, just because we serve, we're a government, you still get the runaround from the government. You've got to find somebody to stick with, or somebody that's going to be your advocate and stay with you the course till you get compensation that you deserve. So there is an educational piece to that because when you come home, you're, you're the new person. Like, this is the new dad. This is what you get when you get home. Unless you have those avenues where you can seek that medical attention and get the help that you need, that's what the family has to deal with. And lots of times, you don't even get the support that you need because the wife's been, you know, playing the role of husband and wife since you've been gone. She's been dealing with the kids, dealing with everything. She's, she's got some independence. Now, here you come. You go off sometimes. You'll have crazy. You, 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 you know, you're, you're ready to go. You know, you're short-fused. She has to deal with that. So a lot of times they don't even make it to where they get the full family support because she's gone. She's divorced. So you have to see that's where the education piece comes in where this is the new you. This is the new dad. This is where dad is at. Instead of the wife and the children waiting, well, when's dad going to be the same? When we're going to go fishing? He might not be able to get to that point. He might not even be able to discuss it. He might not even know what's going on with himself. He just knows it's not the same. A lot of times they turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol, but you still need that help. So, okay. all three year old, I'm going to let you kind of elaborate because what I'm hoping this show do is reach out to veterans who are suffering out there. But I, I, I haven't. <clears throat> Excuse me. Passed by Lincoln Park, and I, I, I always try to stop and see what's going on with people. And here was a veteran, homeless, and, and be. with an alcohol bottle in his hand. So I, I'm, I'm hoping we can kind of, with this show, kind of help people seek a service. So can you kind of elaborate on that, gas? I sure and, can. And I, since you just, uh, you'd be surprised how many veterans don't come into society. 
you find them out there in the woods, you know, living on their own because they cannot deal with people. Uh, when when I came back, like a, like I said, I was not my myself. Nobody knew that. Uh, I'm just gonna say this if you envision it. When I came back at Waterloo Airport, everybody come running at me, and one thing they didn't they did not notice is that I didn't hug nobody. I embraced myself, okay, and just just didn't want nobody to hug me. And um, now. <sighs> I was not. I was not happy no more. There was no joy. Everybody knew I'm a happy-go-lucky guy type of guy. I'm an outdoorsman. All of that ceased. It just stopped. Um, now, the, when I was trying to seek help, it is a. You do have to just go at it and go at it because it, the government is just not going to give it to you. They want this paperwork, that paperwork. That gets lost. Time that, and time and it got, it got, I sat down, just to talk about it, I sat down for a whole hour with one lady, and she had all my paperwork. But then a month later, we got a, a letter saying my paperwork was lost. We were down in Des Moines. How could that be? But, but meanwhile, um, thank God that um, I continued, I continued to push forward and push forward to find the right person to back me up, uh, for me to be awarded uh, my compensation and everything. Uh, but PT PTSD is, is a, it's a serious thing since we're talking about that. Um, and adding to what uh, Gaston has just uh, expounded on, um, in order to We've told you about, we're telling you about PTSD, but there, to get help, there are, there are avenues out there to get help, uh, more specifically in service organizations. And uh, my service organization is uh, the Military Order of the Purple Heart, and they have a particular service officer that uh, his job is to help veterans and, and their adaption back to uh, civilian life, so to speak. And there are several organizations out there that have effective uh, uh, service organizations, i.e., uh, the AMVETS, the VFW, and uh, the DAV. And uh, particularly the DAV, uh, they're very good at, at getting aid and help for uh, soldiers from the standpoint that they're part of the Veterans uh, Administration. The DAV, you want to tell what the DAV stands for? Disabled American, Disabled American Veterans. Okay. And the MOPH is the Military Order of the Purple Heart. So, so there was, there's, the, uh, as Anthony Tisdale was saying, there was there some organizations that you might want to contact and um, see their service officer. Yeah, uh, see the service officer that's in, in the Seagull Valley. That was just that Dr. Dottie Simpson Taylor. She kids. She's in Indianapolis, Indiana. Who's the founder of Sister Soldier Network? And she was supposed to call in and and share with us. She's also a Vietnam vet, and I, I just hung up on her. So I'm hoping I can get her back so she can also share. And we also have had uh, uh, Captain Lord Green. Is that what? Did I have that right? I'm going to let him introduce himself. We have Lord Green just to join us, so I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell who his rank and, and his service and his... Uh, all right, to all you vets out there, Terrence Park, <laughs> I, uh, I just walked in, I thought it was 10.30, but uh, I'm proud to be a vet, and you're talking about the post-traumatic stress disorder, the biggest support system is your family. Your family can help you get over the hump. Now, I don't suffer from that. Praise the Lord, I don't suffer from that. I'm a Vietnam War era veteran. I served in Vietnam. I wasn't in the, uh, the storm or over in the sand pile. But I had an advantage over a lot of the troops. I had already been in the service. I had already trained for Jungle Guerrilla Warfare with the 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii. And for those of you that think Hawaii is a 
paradise. There's some parts up there on the Kulau Mountains that's uninhabitable by human beings because it's so rough. It's so rough and it's already raining. And I don't know what I can add to what's already been said because I don't know what's already been said. But uh, one thing I can say to all you bets out there is if you do what you do, you get what you get. I was uh, unfortunate enough to be in Agent Orange and I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I went through the treatment and they grandfathered the prostate cancer into the Agent Orange in Vietnam. And my first question was when I was diagnosed, and it's just serious enough, go get some help. You know, talk to your family. Your family may not understand what's going on. You all right, Gaston? Your family may not understand but uh, you got to have someone to vent your, your, your frustrations and your PTSD on. You can't keep it to yourself. Uh, it, it's caused a lot of veterans to commit suicide. That's, yes. that's serious. That Fort Lewis, Washington uh, was, was the rebel devil for the, most of the Gulf War vets. Their short stay there, they have the highest rate of uh, suicide of any military installation. These young men are coming back. You just can't, I've always said, you just can't take a, a normal, rational human being, put them in combat, teach them how to kill. They're doing their job today. Tomorrow you fly them back home to their families. Well, that should be a transition period where they can cool down. Debriefing. You just can't put a man in that situation like, uh, since I got the mic, I want to tell you all about an incident. We came back from Vietnam. We got in at 3.30 in the morning on the plane. We had on fresh khakis. Maybe Tony can allude to this. And they said, uh, I was the highest ranking one there. They said, Sergeant Green, marching to the mess hall, which is a mile and a half down this street. Now, this street went through the dependence quarters. And so I'm walking along with him, hot, hot, three, four. And I got to thinking, they've been laying up in this bed, had steak last night. Yesterday we was in Vietnam. So I started calling Jody Cadence at the top of my voice. And people were coming out on their steps. Oh, be quiet, be quiet. Trying to sleep, but we got louder. Oh, we got a lot of it. I don't know, but I believe we'll be home by Christmas Eve. You all right, brother? Yes. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. But PTSD is a form of, it's, 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 a, it's not a sickness. I can't call it a sickness. Uncle Sam did this to American troops. They're doing it to this day. They train them to be killers today. Tomorrow they release them back into civilian life and they're monsters. It must be a diffusing time. I do believe that Uncle Sam should have, should have some way to put these young men on a base and defuse them for at least a week because it's, they are some dangerous individuals when they come home. All they know is to shoot, kill, maim, destroy, rape, and pillage. That's all they've been taught. So, I'm so, going uh, to let it, you uh, go around the room and, and kind of talk about uh, your experience in terms of what you should, could suggest that could happen to young people that are, that are coming home from war today, what happened, what your feelings when you came home, and, and how you can kind of hopefully help some young person before they self-destruct uh, in the Cedar Valley. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and try to talk about this. Um, my problem was that um, when I was with the 101st Airborne, we was over there in, in Iraq, and when the war ended, I was back home from Iraq to Waterloo, Iowa, within 24 hours. That's what I'm talking about. 
I did not have no time to do any kind of adjustment. I come from a, a combat zone to home, but my mind was messed up. See, my mind was messed up. I, within 24 hours, how could I adjust? And and I just know what I was saying. And so, no, I was not myself. And then the military realized what well, after that they they realized. They made a mistake. They thought they was doing us justice by getting us out of that combat zone and getting us home immediately. And a lot of soldiers not, did not return back after, you know, after getting home because their mind was messed up and everything, and they done some wrongdoing things. But nowadays, they do get debriefed. Mm -hmm. I think for about 30 days or so, they do get to talk to a doctor before they get to come home. Thank God they do. Um, and, and still, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you a quick story here real, real quick. Uh, I was in Medicom, I was at somebody's house uh, up in the Appleton, Iowa. And, and, this, and this soldier was just come home, just come home. And all his family was there. And I was just doing my service tech thing, okay, fixing this cable. And, and before I left, I said, do you mind if I shake the hand of a hero? But that, that, that soldier noticed something about me, he recognized something about me. And I shook his hand. He looked me dead in the eye. He said, are you military? I said, I was. I'm prior military. I was with the 101st Airborne. I served over in Iraq. That soldier bust out in tears. He hadn't cried the whole time his family had been around him. And he grabbed hold of me and held me because he knew that I knew what he'd been through. And so, and that's all I want to say for right now. But uh, like I said, my, the problem when I first experienced it with is when they sent me directly home from Iraq, <laughs> that was a terrible mistake for the military to do. And that's all I'm going to say for right now. Yeah, Tina, you need to be an uh, uh, Tina uh, captain. Uh, Colonel, I'm, 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 I'm trying Colonel, to get some clarification you, here because... Can you, can you talk a little bit about it from the uh, current experience? Well, I just deal with the soldiers who have come back within the last 20 years from that from the two... Um, gun wars that we've had, and th they don't fare well. They don't fare well at all, simply because a lot of them want to get home, like Aston was saying, but you, you have to be truthful when you do the post-deployment assessment. You know, have you, have you had any signs of depression or any PTSD? They're not going to tell the truth. So when they do get home, yes, that's when it starts to show. So, and it doesn't matter whether they told the truth or not, you know, I can see their point trying to get home. You still need to seek the help. If you get, you just have to get past that stigmatism that I'm weak. Especially, especially, I see it more in the Marines with the Marines. You know, sign of being strong. You know, Army, gung ho, hua. You know, you have to get past that. You need help. If you broke your arm, you go get some help. You go get that arm fixed. So it's the same with mental health. You still need to seek. You still need to seek. You know, proper help. <coughs> So Anthony, you want to talk a little bit about And Anthony's giving you some good places who, if you don't know where to go, one of these agencies should be able to point you in the right direction. Yeah, they have service officers in, in basically all of the military, uh, post-military organizations, IEM, vets, uh, BFW, uh, Military Order of Purple Heart, and uh, and one of my favorites is the DAV, Disabled uh, Veterans Association. Um, I like... I too like better uh, uh, Gaston. I I came straight from Vietnam back to Waterloo, Iowa. Where did I? I went to Detroit. Well, anyway, I was discharged. I I was discharged by the, they had to figure it out. By the time I got to to U.S. soil, I would be out of the army, and there was no transition, um, and there was no aid in helping me flow back into society, and. Uh, I, just like many other vets, we just went the wrong way when we got back here because uh, the world had changed in the United States. We weren't living uh, on uh, 1920, uh, 1915 uh, cultures that we were in in Vietnam. Uh, the culture over there is quite different from what it is in the United States. And there was an adaptation process that we weren't uh, afforded the uh, opportunity to uh, to have in that transition. Um, Coming today, soldiers 
I believe, uh, sometimes have it worse than we did. Uh, we had our booby traps and things of that nature, but there, 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 in, in, in our era, we had uh, rents, rear echelon people. Uh, today, the whole base is a combat zone. The whole country is a combat zone. So their stress uh, sensors are worse than ours were, so to speak. And uh, you have, uh, you know, it seems like every day, you have demolition experts getting blown up by bombs. They're trying to, to uh, disarm. And that's quite foreign to me because I have my own ideas about that, that they weren't trained properly. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a different day and age for our military. And I think the stress factors are, are worse than they've been in any other uh, military uh, conflict. Possibly other than, than World War One, when they were throwing gas at you in trenches and all that stuff. I, I want to talk a little, a little historical, little historical uh, from a historical perspective. The, the Vietnam War is going to be uh, 50 years next year, and don't age us. And and, and <laughs> I didn't want to age you, but I want you to kind of tell me, uh, talk to the uh, audience a little bit about. Well, even though you served in the war in, in the 60s, you came back home to the United States. Uh, what kind of um, feelings of, as an African American uh, uh, treatment as an African American did you get with, in, the, in the height of the civil rights movement in the 60s? Uh, well, Mr. Skipper, I went into service in 1960. I joined the Army here in Waterloo, and I was shipped to Fort Hood, Texas. Took my basic training, was coming home from, for my AIT, and I went to the Greyhound bus station to get me a, a burger or something that was in uh, Killeen, Texas. And I was politely told that I could not eat in that cafeteria. Well, I had a tray. I had my pie, my two milks, my silverware, and I said, what did you say? They said, well, we don't serve you people here in this restaurant, you got to go over there. So I took my tray, took a step to the rear, and just dropped it on the floor. I know no other way to be. I'm rebellious. That's the first time I uh, experienced racism in the United States Army. Now on the military base, Fort Hood, uh, they were not prejudiced because you had to live by the military doctrine. But when I came home, I found out that the best people to help you get over your stress was your family. I said that earlier and I'll say that again. Your family has, has to bend over backwards to give you a little latitude in the way that you act. Now, your family can help you and they can hurt you if they don't understand what you're going through. I look at my brother Gaston and I feel his pain. I feel uh, Tony's pain. You cannot understand what we go through unless you went through it. You can never forget it. You can never let no one talk to you bad about it. If there's something to be said bad, let us say it to each other, but there's nothing that you can say. Now, me and Tony and, and uh, Gaston can say things to each other that I, we won't let you say to us because we've got that creed, that camaraderie of being veterans. Now, I don't know you, ma'am. I, I, I don't know you, but I applaud the things that you said. And I hope that... Uh, this program will reach out to those veterans out there having their coffee and let us tell you that you're not alone. If you need someone to talk to, talk to us. I'm in the phone book, Gaston is and Tony is, and if we have to form our own veterans support group, we can do that better than the people that the, some service organizations can. We can get together as, as men of the community, as veterans of Waterloo, Iowa,
to help our fellow soldiers. So if you need help, give us a call. We're in the phone book. If you want to call the radio station, call the radio station. They'll give us a, a name and number. But if there is a problem out there, we got to address it now. Because if not, it's going to filter on down to our children. What they see us do, they're going to do. <clears throat> so we've got to be strong. And I, I just hope that people will call and get the help that they need. Nobody knows but you. That's about it. And Anthony, you want to talk a little bit about the historic perspective of serving as a Vietnam vet and how coming home and, and the kind of, some of the kind of things that you met in, in terms of the, the period in the 60s? Well, I didn't realize it then, but I can, I can the hindsight is 2020, and you can see very well what you did wrong. Yep. Uh, I think uh, within two years I was working on my second marriage and uh, and I'm on my third now so I, I had some instability as, uh, psychologically as far as uh, relationships was concerned and that's evidence in those three marriages but um, when I came back, I dared any of the protesters to say one word to me. And uh, I was pretty defiant. I was drafted to serve my country, and here these guys are running around with coffins of uh, uh, American soldiers or Vietnamese with the American flag on it. It was tough on me uh, uh, as far as our country's alliances were uh, uh, publicly then. But uh, fortunately, there were some service organizations that took me years to find out about it. These service organizations got to make themselves available to these soldiers coming home now because, as I stated before, their psychological conditions that they had to uh, serve under were, uh, the stress factor was much higher than what I had. And I'm not belittling uh, any uh, Vietnam veterans or anything, but these present soldiers, they. Like I said, there's no rear area in Afghanistan. I didn't know there's no uh, Saigon or Taysan that's a safe area or, or, or a safe populous area. Uh, the whole country is a war zone. You want to talk a little bit about your experience in coming from Afghanistan? Yes, sir. Well, I came from Iraq, but um, Iraq. <clears throat> I received the hero's welcome, which was fine and dandy. That was nice. It was very beautiful and everything, but I came back mentally disturbed. Uh, and, <laughs> and some people would say that. And, um, but the key thing that, like uh, Mr. Green and Mr. Tisdale were saying, was uh, communication. That's the key right there. And what's that motto? Communicate to educate? Yeah. That's what Kate Bucci says. Yeah, I truly believe in that. And so, um, even though I retired back in 1995, PTSD still yeah. disturbs me today. Okay, and I was just triggered here, just from hearing it. And that is nothing you can run from. Okay, and so uh, if, if you you can't hide from if you need, if you do need help. There is a lot of agencies out here that can help you and get you started in the right direction to uh, get you help. And that's what I want to say. Tina, yeah, you can talk a little I, bit. I would suggest that you get, if you find one agency that works for you, someone who you know is going to bat for you, you can tell somebody just going through the motion. You can tell someone's really sincere. Stick with that person and again, make tons and tons of copies of your records because they do get lost. And I don't know why that happens. That is so disheartening to hear that your whole medical record has been lost, really? You know, you just need to be sure that you have it covered for yourself that you give it to them again. Because it's going to get lost in the system before you get to the point where you're going to get your, your disability. Trust me. It's not, you're not going to have one packet that's going to go all the way through where somebody doesn't lose it. Too many people turn hands, you know, from civilian to the military. It, the turnover is too great and people don't follow through when they leave. They just leave your packet somewhere on somebody's desk just sitting there. So you need to make sure you have your eyes on that packet all the way through. Make sure you have the papers that they'll be pulling out that are missing. Make sure you just keep a, a 
some copy files of your own military record. And from a historical perspective, can oh. you uh, still oh. serve in, what, have you seen, because uh, you've been in about, you said 24 years, have you seen the, the, the changes in terms of, um, of racial disparity in the military uh, improve or stay the same? Or? It's not the same as when the, when the Vietnam, when the soldiers came back to Vietnam. That's the it's not the same. The soldiers in this era that, that I'm in is totally different. As Captain Tisdale was saying, you know, when he came back to Vietnam, it's different when you come back from Iraq, it's different when you come back from Af Afghanistan. Um, they, they really don't know what to do. These soldiers have been paid a high, uh, uh, their income is higher while they're over there serving, then they come back here and they can't get a job. They've been, they've been in positions of management, you know, you've been the first sergeant, you've been head of a platoon, you come back here, you want a job that does that, but you don't know how to even, you don't even know how to access the workforce because you don't even know, you don't even know how to, to fill out the application. That's what these soldiers are facing now. They do not know how to sell themselves from the military side to, to tr transition what they, the military duty is to the civilian side to even fill out an application. So you got all these young soldiers who are coming back who do not know how to transition into the workforce using their using their, their abilities that they had in the military. They don't know how to transform that. You know, you say you're a hand operator. Okay, transform that into a civilian job. They don't know how to do that. So that's going to be a big issue, aside from everybody coming back with post-traumatic stress syndrome. Plus, it's, it's, we're not even talking about females. There's so many females who are, are suffering from the same thing. We don't even talk about females in the Army. You think just everybody in Iraq and Afghanistan is all males. That's not true. You'll hear that later. You're hearing it now because of <coughs> rapes and stuff, but you don't hear any document documentaries or any commentaries about women who have died in the military. So, so uh, Sister Soldier Network was uh, started by Dr. Dottie Simpson Taylor, uh, uh, a native of Waterloo, and she had worked with military women who were coming back from service and saw the disparity, and that's why she started Sister Soldier Network to address those issues. Um, she uh, can be reached at, at sistersoldiernetwork.com, and she can also be reached by phone if there's a military woman that, that needs some assistance, and, and that number is 317-517-6319. Um, she, uh, she wants to reach out to women and, and direct them in the service and let them know that they serve their country just like their male counterpart did. So, um, the, the other thing, uh, back to where we started, we had started out talking talking about, and this is um, KBBG Veterans Day, um, Sister Soldier Network, and Cedar Valley African American Coalition is bringing this program to you, and we, we're hoping we can help some um, person out there who's uh, suffering for one reason or another. So the next phase we want to kind of close this out is talking about what uh, we can do as an organization who um, I'm, I'm hoping that this kind of get uh, some kind of coalition going in terms of African Americans getting together and at least starting to help young people or people in the community who are thinking that they're out there alone and we're going to kind of talk about how, uh, if, if you want to share your personal information with, with people that might need, uh, who, who might need that hand or uh, need somebody to talk to, uh, I'm hoping if, if you, uh, we can hopefully set up some location with phone number and email that, that people can, can uh, get, uh, get, it, get help out there with. And so I'm going to sense Anthony is a court Anthony and Aunt Lord Green are two of the members who serve on the Cedar Valley African American Coalition. I want you to kind of talk about uh, what we're going to do in February in terms of paying tribute to African Americans in, in the Cedar Valley or in the quarter. I, I know Tony wants to say something, but let me say this first, because Tony is long-winded. He loves to <laughs> hear himself talk. Uh, this program would be for naught if we didn't reach one veteran with this problem. I, you know, I get fed up with programs that talk and don't walk, if you understand what I'm trying to say. If there's one veteran out there that needs help, what are you waiting on? Do you want to spend the rest of your life thinking, 
worrying, sleeping with one eye open, locking your doors when you go in the bathroom, stuff like that. Well, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Looking over your shoulder, never sitting in a room with your back to the door, never trusting nobody, completely trusting anybody. You got to call and get some help because that's not natural. I keep saying that's not natural for people to act this way. And if we don't reach but one person, let's reach them. Or this program is for naught. Okay, Tony, you got 30 seconds. <laughs> thank, thank you, Lloyd. Uh, you scared me. Uh, let's, let's not forget one thing. I, this is not a a shoot down of the military service or anything of that nature. As a matter of fact, I think it's the military still looking at hindsight now as a good career choice. Uh, there's no telling where I could have ended up or what rank I could have been or what uh, agency I could have been working for if I had re retained, uh, stayed within the military. But I still think, uh, as Lloyd was saying, we still need uh, networks among communities to help our, our, our past soldiers out. And we need, I don't, I, I don't know if I could be corrected on this or not, but when I was in the military, the, the uh, African American officers were few and far between. Yeah. Um, and I remember when we graduated from Officer Candidate School, I think there were three of us in the class, and they pulled one of them out at the during the graduation ceremonies because his background investigation with the uh, FBI didn't uh, pan out as uh, the leaders of that, that program thought they should. So, but I, and my, uh, so I, I had, I wanted to know about who invested, who did they talk to here in Waterloo and stuff, and uh, I got some good reps. Uh, I think I talked to, I had to talk to, I recommend to Carl Neubauer, yeah. uh, Jimmy Most Porter, true. and uh, Reverend Talbert, he's an AME minister, he's uh, retired in Texas now. But one of, one of the individuals they talked to was Jimmy Porter, I know that too. And uh, I, I had a good uh, background investigation in that regard. But uh, as I've said earlier in the program, that hindsight is twenty twenty. I was offered a, a, a career army commission, and at that time, I still had Waterloo still in me, and I could see spending 20 years or 30 years at that time in the military. Uh, I know what I know now. I, I've been out 10 years ago. So, Gaston and, and Tina, do you kind of want to talk a little bit about what you think the military, and if, if you should can encourage young people to to um, be a part of the military or go into the military as a, as a career choice? Well, first of all, I am very, very proud to have served in the United States Army. And I, <laughs> I must say this, um, I don't think it would be a bad idea if all young men coming yeah. out of high school could serve two years in the military. I think that would make the United States a better place to live and stop a lot of these troubles we have with young people nowadays and everything. And uh, just in short, if I could start all over, I would do the same thing right, again. Thank you, brother. How about you? Right. I'm gonna have to agree. Yes, I do believe if you had the military discipline, we wouldn't be seeing the things that we see right now on the streets in Waterloo. I wish all my, I wish my son had gone to the military. I wish my nephews and my grandsons had gone to the military just so they could get that discipline to see that, you know, they run around here wanting want respect, go to the military right. and you'll see. Get that two years. Get that boot camp in you and you'll stop that. Let me, let me put in here because you're right up my alley now. <laughs> I was a drill sergeant for eight years. I trained troops and I still believe, like Gaston said, we take these young men off of the street, put them in the military, or set them down and ask them where are you going to be in five years? In five years in the military, you can set yourself up for life. Five years out of the military, you're going to do 
one of few things. You're going to be on drugs, you're going to be in jail, or you're going to be dead. Now, I don't like to pull my own hat, but I was chief drill sergeant for Mass Military Academy in Massachusetts. Now, when I left that unit to go be a first sergeant in field artillery, field artillery, the Alumni Association named the Leadership Academic Award after me. That's good. And that's still being awarded to this day, the Lloyd Green Award. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a movie star, but I love to train troops. I think that's a, what I was put on earth to do, to be a drill sergeant. And I just look, you walk up and down 4th Street, these young men got their pants down around their ankles. I just want to stop my car and pull over and pull them pants off. But I can't do that. But if I had them in a military setting, with Gaston's help and Tony backing me up, we can do a lot of good here in Waterloo. Yes, sir. If all those veterans get together, we can do a lot of good with these young men. Yes, sir. And they don't realize the shape they're in until you take them somewhere else. you got to get them out of Waterloo. Take them to Chicago somewhere and let them see what a gangster is. And they'll put their tail between their legs and straighten out. If they don't want to straighten out, just leave me in Chicago. Well, you, we have been talking for an hour, believe it or not, and, uh -huh. and, and it looks like we've got about four minutes to wrap up, so I, I'm, I, we've got two minutes to wrap up, so we, we need to kind of say this has been Sister Soldier Network and the Veterans Day roundtable conversation about the, 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 the military experiences and uh, what happens when you come back home. Yeah. As the men, the people, the men and women have said around the table, get, seek, and help. And uh, you've got friends out there, you've got comrades out there that you've served with and who are seeking help and getting help. There's plenty of help, as Anthony Tis, uh, 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 Captain Anthony Tisdale has said, there's, there's help out there. And, and Colonel Angela Douglas has said there's help out there. So, uh, and then also uh, Sergeant uh, Lord Green. And, and Sergeant First Class uh, Gaston Moore. I'm oh, First so, Sergeant. First Sergeant. Call me top. No. Yes. But anyway, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a daughter of a, a veteran, a granddaughter of a veteran, so that, I guess that kind of makes me a part of the club because I, I do know some of the things that happened with my grandfather when he came home from the service. So we, we have uh, hopefully made this a show that we talked about one of the number one causes of suicide and homelessness in the Sea Valley, which is PTSD. And we are planning a whole celebration for Vietnam Vets starting in January and ending in June, as I said, when we first started look for the activities and hopefully come and support the activities that we're going to have starting in January and running through June, which is a, a service day. Um, It, the program, the February program is February 7th and 8th. We're, it's a, a Friday evening. We're, it's a spiritual network workshop. And on Saturday, all day long, we're having activities starting at about 10 o'clock and going until 4 o'clock. And, and at 1 o'clock, we will be paying tribute to Vietnam vets and welcoming them home to the Cedar Valley. 